hello and welcome to my channel. In this video I'm going to be talking about how to remote control a Supermicro server board using the IPMI facility via the network. I've got a server board that's got a problem, it refuses to boot, it stops with an error and doesn't get as far as allowing me to select a boot device. So I thought I'd try to do it remotely instead <clears throat> by remote mounting a, an ISO. Um, this is also a bit of familiarization with IPMI on Supermicro server boards. I'm doing it using a Linux computer, a second machine. Um, I'm sure it works from Windows as well, but I don't have any Windows to play with. So this is Ubuntu. <clears throat> and first thing to do is to uh, connect to the IPMI interface that actually runs on the little BMC chip on the motherboard, which runs independently of the main CPU which means that this can run even if a CPU is crashed or is absent. You, I even did a BIOS update with no CPU plugged in just to see if it would work because I'd never actually done this before. So you need to know the IP address of the um, IPMI interface, which is up here, put in the web browser and you get this page. You need to know the uh, username and password to log in. And I've set these to be the defaults. So the username is admin and the password in capitals. Password is also admin in capitals. So as long as you know the IP address and the password, you can log into this page. <clears throat> and that's uh, important, <laughs> otherwise you're shut out of the machine, especially if it can't boot normally. And um, part of the problem I have is that if you look at hardware information on this page, <clears throat> you can see it says there are two CPUs installed, whereas actually there's only one. But this is old information, this is not updated. And it says there are two RAM modules installed, but actually there's only one, and it's uh, and what is it, 16 gigabyte, not 64 gigabyte module. So this information is out of date. This shows us a problem updating the uh, the hardware so it's not being <coughs> read um, as the system is powered up. So that's well, that's my problem. So um, these are the various different things you can do. And as I said, you need to know <coughs> the IP address. Luckily, in the default settings, the BMC gets an IP address via DHCP from the router in your network, if you have one and it actually displays it on the screen. And we have to zoom out a bit. <coughs> oh, let's scroll instead. Um, I, if you plug a monitor into the server motherboard, it'll pop up with this as it powers up. There's the error where it gets stuck at <coughs> checksum or the 79 step. And um, that's where it's stuck at the moment, but it tells you the BMC IP address. So you can connect to this and use it to remote control the machine. And what we're looking at here, this is the remote control KVM remote desktop via the network. So you don't need to have a monitor plugged in, only just to get the IP address in the first place. So if we go back to the web browser, you can see that um, because I'm displaying the remote terminal, then it gives you this warning here that uh, various things are going on. <clears throat> but uh, normally you get a small, well, this is a thumbnail version of it. So what am I gonna talk about? Well, um, let's have a look because I've probably forgotten and <laughs> what I want to do, as I said, remote control it. You, you saw some system information there already via the IPMI system and the remote desktop. And you can do all those things without having a license key installed in the IPMI. It's not necessary for those. If you want to do BIOS and BMC updates and remote ISO mounts, then you do need a license key, which luckily <clears throat> was already stored in this machine. Um, I'm very lucky. Usually it's not on the second hand motherboards that I bought. So if you look here, whoops, in uh, activate license under miscellaneous, you see there's a, a license key that's been put in by a previous user and that is what's needed to be able to do BIOS updates and so on. If you don't have this, then you can't do those. So um, here, for example, if I wanted to update in the BIOS remotely, you just click on BIOS update. You then browse for a file press upload BIOS. It takes a while because it's a 32 megabyte BIOS going by the network. So it takes some time to upload, but then you just go through the usual steps of uploading a BIOS with care, of course, not interrupting power because you can brick the BIOS chip. I'm going to try and reprogram this one directly using a clip-on programmer because it has got a boot sector problem. <clears throat> anyway, so you can do that. Um, the other thing you can do is you present virtual media to the um, the server board. So I can say I want to present a, a CD-ROM image, which is what I'm going to do. And you have to enable a SMB file server in your network <clears throat> that provides 
the ISO image that you want to boot from, which is what I've done. It took a while to make this work because these settings are very critical to get them right. And also the SMB server was fairly critical. I spent a few hours, thank you to the various AIs I used to get, get it to work. And it took quite a few iterations for me to get this working, which is why I thought I'd make this video to show you how to do it. Let me just check that the video is still recording. Yes, it is good. <laughs> so um, that's the purpose of this video really, is to show you how to set up an SMB server. So you need a, a second machine, of course, and I'm sitting here recording the screen of my second machine. That's this, the one I'm remote controlling the server board with. And what I wanted to do was to uh, remotely boot via the network using this remote ISO file. And I wanted to run the diagnostics program from Supermicro. So you have to download it. You can uh, search for this on the Supermicro website and you find they have a, <clears throat> a diagnostics program sort of called this, superdiag with a version number .iso. So it's an ISO file that could be burned to a CD-ROM. You can boot the machine from it. Or in my case, I want to remount it as a remote, remote ISO via the network and then tell the machine to boot from it. So <clears throat> this has to be done from the second machine, which is the one where I'm sitting, and use the Samba or SMB file server protocol. There are various ones, of course, you can use, but these uh, particular super micro boards <clears throat> want a Samba uh, file server. So all you have to do is to install on the command line, which I'll show you, don't be afraid of a command line in Linux. You have to install the Samba server and you have to make a directory to put the ISO file in. So I've, I've used this command. We're not going to show you all these commands. They've already been done. I've just put it in a um, <clears throat> directory under the home user called SuperDiag. I can show you more graphically using the file manager down here. This is home in Ubuntu Linux. And these are the usual things, <clears throat> folders. And I've just added this one called SuperDiag. And in there is that ISO file that I want to present via the network. What I'm going to show you is, is not a very secure thing to do. Um, you wouldn't want to connect this machine to the internet because it would then allow Samba access for uploading or maybe and downloading files. Um, but on a local area network behind a firewall, I feel fairly secure doing this. So um, yes, you install a Samba server and then you download obviously the file from Supermicro, then you have to copy it after you've unzipped it because it's zipped. So I unzipped it into this um, or expanded it, as it says on uh, Linux, into this directory. And then I copied it using this command to copy with subdirectories into um, home super diag that I just showed you on the file manager. <clears throat> so you, you need to put it in the right place. And then you need to uh, change the firewall rules on this desktop machine to allow the Samba server to serve files. This took a bit of fiddling around with. These may be wrong but they certainly work, that's the important thing. So this allows any device in my network, this is all of the IP addresses in my LAN, to um, connect to the Samba server. You have to change file permissions for the directory and for the file. These are the permissions that seem to work. And then you have to edit the config file for the Samba server. <clears throat> so using nano, this is what you have to put into that file in addition to what's already there. So under the global section, you have to specify the server protocols that can be used, minimum and maximum. And apparently NT1 is, is not very secure, but it may be that the main board wants it. So I put them all in from here, one to three, so it'll grab the one it wants. And then the, the, right at the end of the file, you have to put in these lines. Actually, I will show you the file. If I uh, just copy paste this, Control C and then put it into the here. Control Shift V. Oh, <laughs> password. <clears throat> There's the Samba SMB.conf config file, and you can see here right at the beginning under global, I've put those two protocols, and then somewhere way down at the end, I won't go and look for it. Just Control X to exit that. Then I've put these other lines, <clears throat> and then you can just copy paste in. So you need to give it a, a label, which is this in square brackets. And then you have to specify the path where it is, which is here, which I showed you on the file browser. And then you have to put these settings in. So it's browsable, it's read only, which means people can't write to it. Um, <clears throat> guest access is allowed, so you don't need a username and a password to connect to it. But you could put those in if you wanted. In this case, force user equals user. And then you need to put these file permissions in here to correspond with these ones. It took a while 
using an AI to get this right until it actually worked. And, and now it does work. And then you exit from the file, saving it, of course. And then you have to restart the Samba server and so on. So you use this command here to restart to make those settings come into effect. And for a while it wasn't working. And I, what I do is use a third machine on the network to see if it's really working or not using uh, SMB Samba client. What I can do actually is try connecting to this <coughs> using this command. This is the IP address of my second machine, the desktop that you're seeing here. I can uh, use that command to see if the Samba serving is working on the same machine, even using its external IP address in the network. Uh, control shift V, dink. And yes, I've got a Samba prompt, so it, it's managed to connect. Um, it's best to use a third machine to do this with, just to make sure that some other device can access this to get that file. So if I type ls to list the files there, there it is. That's the ISO file being served up via the Samba protocol in the network. And if I type exit, probably we can exit. So that's working now. It took a while. So what we have to do is mount that file on the um, server remotely. And how do I do that? <coughs> Go to the IPMI control panel, which is here. Remember, this only works if you have a valid license key installed. Probably to buy one costs more than the, the second-hand server board, who knows. So what I want to do is I want to um, use virtual media, CD-ROM image, and I've already entered these details. <coughs> this is the IP address of the desktop machine I'm using with the Samba server on it. You have to put that in. And then here, you have to exactly follow this uh, format with the Windows-style backslashes and that's the directory name and that's the file name I want to mount remotely. Um, if you hit the save button it checks if those are actually in the correct format and you can see here um, it's green and it's been saved. I spent a lot of time getting red with an error here saying that the uh, protocol was wrong. So now that it, it's correct you can mount that ISO file by clicking mount yes and hopefully <coughs> yes it's done it. So you can see now there's an ISO file mounted. This one is mounted to this server device here. And I can force it to boot from it remotely. <clears throat> um, the problem is that when the machine boots on its, on its own screen, you never get to the, uh, the part at the bottom here that says press Dell to run setup or F11 to uh, select a boot device. It never gets that far. It's frozen here, as you can see. So <clears throat> this is why I'm doing this remotely. So if I just switch back to here, um, what I want to do is to force it to boot to the mounted ISO file via the network. How am I going to do that? <clears throat> you have to make some settings. Um, so on, on my desktop machine, I had to install a tool called IPMI tool that's in the uh, Ubuntu repository. You don't have to download it manually, so we just install it, apt install, and Maybe you also need these as well. <clears throat> and these come from Supermicro, IPMI Config, and SMC IPMI Tool. So there's, these are three different tools that you can use in Linux for remote controlling the server board. And what I wanted to do was to um, rescan the hardware on the board to make it recognize the CPU and RAM configuration. I haven't got this to work yet. Um, one thing to watch out for, there's this IPMI config command you can use, and it's very simple to reset everything. The only problem is that you don't specify an IP address here, so that means all servers in your network will all be attacked by this command and reset, which may or may not be a good idea. And it only works on servers that have uh, admin and password admin set, so most of them shouldn't have that, of course, except for this one I'm trying to debug. So you have to use this with caution. Um, there's another command. I don't think I ever got this to work using this particular format, which is why I tried this one and uh, messed up a few other things on the way. So I'm not going to use those. Um, using IPMI tool, you can uh, tell it to reset and to hopefully um, reset the stored parameters. And again, this isn't quite working because I think this uh, main board is buggy. So what I'm going to do because I want to run diagnostics, is to set the boot device on the machine remotely to boot from a CD-ROM that's been presented to it, that ISO file. So if I just do Control C, copy that, and post it in, paste it into here, 
Okay, it's the machine's responded, hopefully, that the set boot device is now CD-ROM. I'm not sure this is generated locally on this machine or whether that was a response in the other one. If I change the password to something else and try it, let's see what happens. Something for someone else to play with. So it's been told to boot from a CD-ROM. I can check what it thinks it's booting from using this command, which really does read from the server. So control C. Okay. <clears throat> and this is the response from the server that says, uh, da -da, boot flag valid, that sounds good. Oh yeah, boot device selector force boot from CD or DVD. So it's forced to boot from the DVD ISO that's being remotely presented to it. And then you have to tell it to actually reboot. And you can do that also from the command line, from the controlling device here, <coughs> using this power reset. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. It's a bit buggy, this motherboard I'm testing. You can also, rather than just do a reset, you can actually power cycle the whole main board. So it really turns the power off and turns it back on again when it's working. And then hopefully it'll boot. Um, Mine doesn't actually boot from the ISO file yet because there's a problem. I'm going to uh, reflash the whole BIOS, um, which I've already done remotely, but it wasn't enough because there's a boot sector corruption, I believe. So I'm going to have to do it <coughs> using a clip and a CH341A programmer chip, which I might make a video about. Anyway, I think that's enough for now. Remember to proceed with caution when you're doing things like this because you're at the lowest level of hardware and you can easily corrupt things or lose contact with the device if you accidentally reset the IP address or change the password to something that you don't know. So you really have to be uh, quite careful when doing this, but uh, the board is kind of bricked anyway, so I don't mind playing with it like this. And I look forward to seeing your comments and questions. Maybe you'll help me to uh, solve the, the problem with this board. Thank you for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. Oh, and there's a short video too, which uh, will actually show the hardware that's in use.